I am the uh, Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Illinois Chicago. And I'd like to welcome everyone this morning to the first in our four part series hosted by, um, or rather um, uh, given by Annalisa Samara. And I think many of you here in the seminar this morning are aware of Annalisa. So I won't take a whole lot of time to introduce her except to say that she is a, a pillar in the Chicago MedTech um, entrepreneurial system. It's wonderful to see people from other institutions around the state. Great to see everybody here. We are recording um, this uh, seminar so that we'll be able to post it um, on the um, FAST Center uh, website and you can have access to it later. And I think that we will just get started because we don't have a whole lot of time and we have a lot of people and probably a lot of questions. So welcome everyone and um, welcome to Annalisa Samara. Great, thank you so much for the introduction uh, there, Cynthia. Um, you know, uh, I'm so happy that you all are able to join me this morning in, to talk about a topic that is very near to, and dear to my heart, and that's non-dilutive funding. And it's something that I've been working on for a very long time, since since 2008, and I'll, I'll kind of go into the kind of my, my background in just a second. Um, but I'm going to share my screen, and I think how this is going to work in terms of questions, please feel free to, you know, ask them in the chat. Um, and I have some, you know, folks here that can kind of uh, um, let me know as, as they do come in and, uh, you know, can kind of take them as they go and depending on the volume or uh, might push some of them off to the very end, but, uh, you know, we'll definitely get to them. So, um, you know, very happy to be here. In terms of uh, my experience, I, I've all I know is startups. <laughs> Let's just start with that. All I know is startups. I've been working with startups for a very long time, for about 18 years wearing many different hats, uh, including technology transfer, venture capital, and uh, playing senior management roles at the VP level or higher in over six startups. Uh, and, and they're all based here in the Chicagoland area. Um, and currently I'm uh, the CEO of a company called Reos. Uh, Reos is a medical device company uh, whose technology spun out of Northwestern University. We're developing a wearable skin patch that is this right here in my hand. Um, but, you know, in addition to, you know, my role um, as CEO, um, I'm also an SBI or STTR mentor in, in different organizations in the Chicagoland area, and it's because I love SBIRs, and I also, um, the entrepreneurial community here in Chicago has um, made such an impact in my life, and I have lots of, um, you know, individuals, community that I consider my friends. So, you know, in large part, this is my my way of, of giving back and also sharing knowledge um, that I've learned along the way, um, whether it's through my startups or through, you know, SBIRs. Um, you know, happy to happy to share that insight. I'm also involved in a number of organizations here um, in the area, like Women in Bio and M Hub. Um, but the reason why we're here um, is because of grants. Um, and like I said, I've been working on them for a very long time. Um, I know that money is needed to keep the lights on. Um, you know, you can have uh, hopes and dreams and drive, but you need that money to keep things going. Um, dilutive capital is, 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 is hard to, um, to get. Uh, so is non-dilutive, but, you know, I think non-dilutive funding uh, can be glorious uh, for many reasons. So in terms of my experience, I've uh, been working on grants for a really long time, have helped bring uh, a lot of money to uh, a lot of companies, uh, primarily in Illinois, but, you know, a few uh, sprinkled across the, the rest of the U.S., um, I have worked on NIH, DOD, NSF grants, a couple NASA, a couple Air Force grants, Air Force grants, but primarily um, NIH and, and NSF are, are kind of my sweet spot. Um, I've also been a PI on multiple SBIRs, so um, my I guess uh, I, I come to this presentation saying that I'm you know probably like you all in, in the audience, I, I know what it's like to, you know, be a researcher at a university looking to hope, you know, maybe thinking about uh, transitioning that technology out. I, I know what it's like to operate a company and wonder, um, you know, if you will be able to run payroll. Um, and I also, you know, what it's like to be, you know, uh, a startup employee, uh, you know, uh, not, not sure whether or not, um, you, you know, your company will, will make it to next week. Um, and uh, which is why um, I, you know, feel very strongly about um, getting money in the company. Um, and I think a non-dilutive funding is, is very appealing. Um, and uh, in, in many ways, it can be 
considered a company's best friend um, and oftentimes uh, the first dollar in, in into the company. So I guess in, tor in terms of kind of where, how it all started for me, just, in, you know, for background so that you guys can kind of get a sense of the history here. Um, I started working on SBIRs when I was working in early stage VC. So I was working in uh, a fund, a small fund that invested, you know, very early, uh, primarily in university-based technologies. And we invested not, you know, we invested in the in, in companies, but didn't write huge checks. You know, maybe in the order of like a hundred thousand, uh, under two hundred thousand, um, you know, as, as a first check in. And my boss at the time um, said, "You know what? Um, you know, our checks aren't enough to, you know, enable commercialization of therapeutic drugs, for example. So I want you to learn about SBIRs and just go figure it out." So it was, essentially, I was kind of thrown into the deep end of a pool. And in you know, many ways, that's kind of like the best way to learn. Um, and the way that I got started is that I, I went to these SBIR workshops. Oh, they don't really look like this. I just put a fancy one for attention, but um, I think this is good for an example. But I went to um, SBIR workshops so that I can learn. Um, and I went to these two-day workshops um, at, in, in Chicago. And I actually went not, not once, not twice, but three times because I didn't get it the first two times. And it was just a, such a huge data dump, um, you know, uh, for, for the workshops. But, um, you know, that's where I got that first exposure um, and was able to, you know, absorb and, you know, take the, you know, those learnings and, you know, uh, work with portfolio companies that we, you know, that we invested in, obviously, but was able to add more dollars into the company and, you know, enable them to keep the lights on and hit value inflection milestones, you know, that sort of thing. So after, you know, those experiences, I thought that was, that was actually pretty uh, fulfilling and I enjoy them. And I said, you know what, I think I'd like to, you know, help add value to other companies and then kind of just my SBR, like, um, I guess, uh, um, profession kind of just like exploded. And I worked with a, a number of companies and I started wearing different hats. Um, and then so, um, you know, kind of fast forward to, you know, 2019, uh, when I when I joined my, my current company, um, you know, we I took those learnings and we started off with a with a small grant, which I think is fabulous, you know, a phase one grant. And then eventually we got a whopping, you know, $4 million grant. So um, I think it's through these experiences I'd like to share with you. And, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, one day you guys can, you know, use this shocked emoji too <laughs> when getting when getting your company grants um, and it'll be your biggest cheerleader, of course. So in terms of, you know, the agenda that, you know, I'd like to run through, I'm going to give an overview of what SBRs and STTRs are. You may have you know, heard about them through, you know, uh, other companies in the area may have done your own, uh, you know, research online. Um, but, you know, hopefully I'll add, you know, to some of that knowledge, add a bit more color. I also go into different government agencies that participate in this, in this program. Um, and then I'll get into, um, I think, some of the, um, the, like, the good stuff, I guess, um, you know, kind of grant application tips based on my own experiences of, um, you know, success, failures, uh, tears, and, you know, uh, tears of, uh, of sadness and tears of joy so that, um, you know, you can have, um, you know, so you can submit a successful application, then I'll go into, you know, some resources and, you know, happy to take uh, any questions. All right, so let's get into it. So SBR and STTR, you may have heard of, you know, uh, these letters, but um, it really involves small business. Um, so SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research, or uh, CTR, Small Business Technology Transfer, the main difference, and there are, you know, several differences between the two, but I think if we were to take one thing away uh, in terms of the differences is that the STTR requires a partnership with the university and an SBIR, um, you know, allows for it. So one requires it, the other one allows for it. Anyway, this whole program provides over $2 billion dollars in uh, R&D funding by way of grants and contracts to for-profit, not not-for-profit, but for-profit small business um, US-based companies. And really it's to develop new and innovative um, technologies that can help um, you know, uh, improve the American economy and you know, improve the lives of uh, Americans. So in terms of the goals uh, of the program, it's really, to uh, stimulate that tech, you know, that, that uh, you know, back of a napkin idea to take that 
you know, put some money into it, do R and D work, um, and then kind of follow a, a commercialization path. So we go from, you know, uh, stimulating that 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 technical idea, providing R and D funding, you know, get some you know folks from all walks of life to participate, um, you know, in this type of funding, um, and then uh, with uh, you know added, you know, with uh, with milestones achieved as a result of the funding, then that will you know increase. Uh, private sector, so venture capital or industry-sponsored research, that sort of thing, uh, that fund, you know, that type of attraction, uh, you know, to the company, and then also through STTR's really a uh, program goal is to foster technology transfer um, through cooperative R and D between that small business, that for-profit entity, and a research institution like the the fine ones that we have here in the Chicago area. So kind of a high level view of what, you know, uh, SBR and STTRs are uh, in terms of the funding. So this is a program um, that is mandated, uh, you know, by, by Congress where, um, you know, 2% of federal R&D budgets across um, different research institutions like the NIH, DOD, et cetera, um, allocate funding just for small businesses. And that's great. Um, you know, certainly there's a, a lot of academic funding, which is, also fabulous, but this is just set aside funding for those, you know, for profit, um, you know, small entities and you know, it's a pretty big budget every year, um, you know, about, you know, $4 billion in, in this type of funding is deployed. Um, I think another really big point about SBIs and STTRs is that it's not meant to be an alternative funding source for an academic lab. Um, you know, I think I, I talk with I've talked with many you know researchers um, you know over the past two decades, and you know some kind of take that approach. Well, they say you know you know we can use my lab, it'll fund my lab, that sort of thing. Well, you can do that maybe through an STTR, through that as a subcontractor, but as a main applicant, you know you have to be you know a business with your own space, and then you can partner uh, with with universities uh, that sort of thing. But it's not meant to be. Um, a, you know, funding source uh, for for um, you know for basic research. That's why that's the kind of like the purpose of um, you know the kind of the set aside and set aside for small businesses. So this non dilutive funding, and I've said non dilutive a number of times, and some of you may not know what that means. So uh, when you let's talk about maybe dilutive funding uh, first. So with dilutive funding, kind of think about uh, you know angel or venture capitalists where they give you money in exchange for a slice of the pie, your ownership pie. So that exchange is by way of equity if they gave you money. So that's dilutive funding. So you're, you know, a kind of diluting uh, your, your ownership there through that type of funding. Whereas non-dilutive funding, you're not giving up any ownership. So this is this is cash money, this is grant, but there are definitely strings attached um, in terms of keeping good accounting records, that sort of thing. I can get into that a little bit, but that's kind of like the, the, the main difference between non-dilutive and, and dilutive funding. But, um, you know, really this funding is meant to, um, you know, fund the company for um, employees, um, you know, your rents, your lab, et cetera, materials, supplies that you need to do your research to achieve your uh, research milestones and the project that you set forth. So it's really funding that product development it's, it's through a phased approach. Um, where phase one, um, you know, is essentially feasibility, like, does this even work, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, potentially like outside of, you know, the academic lab, and phase two is, you know, a longer research project with more money, and that's meant for that kind of full uh, R&D plan. So, you know, the, the government can fund phase one and phase two uh, with their dollars, and phase three is really commercialization, you hitting the market and selling. Right. And at, at that time, you know, no federal funding um, is, a, is, um, is, is given out at that time. Um, there are some agencies that have um, in between non dilutive funding in between phase two and phase three um, by way of phase two B grants um, agencies like uh, the NSF and NIH, for instance, um, you know, have those dollars. So I think there's, you know, several questions in the chat. I don't know if I can get some support here if we, if we want to answer those or if we can uh, wait for those. And Annalisa, there's a question about phase three awards, perhaps maybe with DOD where you'd have contracts that would be the next step would be appropriate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's, um, yeah, some agencies, um, you know, do have that where um, the customer is the DOD. Um, so that would be, you know, through that, um, that contract mechanism. So I think that's an important point too. So DODs do contracts as opposed to, to grants. Um, and in that, in that instance, um, you know, they would be the customer. 
Great. Any other questions? Before that, um, it says you mentioned STTR requires a partnership with the university. Mm -hmm. What would qualify as a partnership requirement and what would not qualify? Sure, sure. I think the um, the the quickest answer to that um, is the partnership by way of an executed contract where um, a percentage of the budget is allocated to the university. So if you know the grant um, is is favorably reviewed, uh, you know by the NIH or NSF, for instance, um, then uh, there will be some uh, just in time documentation required where things like a, a contract executed with with, um, you know, the university needs to be provided, um, you know, for the for the funds to be distributed, that sort of thing. And in terms of the work that the university uh, would do, they would play a particular part in the specific aims or objectives um, that you're setting forth in the project. So, for instance, if you have a um, you know three specific aims in your in your phase one um, STTR, um, they could be responsible for you know maybe. Uh, the second aim, for instance. So they have to play a research role um, using their uh, facilities, their personnel, et cetera. And all of that is um, under the contract uh, between uh, the company and the university. Annalisa, we had a follow-up to the um, DOD contracts and that was um, for DOD, are there contracts for phase three only or also for phase one and phase two? So for so the whole process with the DOD, those are contracts. Phase one and phase two are contracts, but phase three is when the DOD can be the customer. Mm -hmm. um, it, that that sort of thing. Um, so when so other institutes also have um, contracts, um, like uh, you know NIH. There are, NIH has SBIR contracts, you know that that sort of thing. NSF does not, but the DOD it's a, it's a contract from the start to the very end. Right. Right. Um, we're getting quite a few questions, and I think in the interest of time, maybe we'll save those until the last 10 or 15 minutes okay. and allow Annalisa, because I have a feeling she's going to answer some of these questions as she moves along. So I think we'll, we'll keep Okay, moving. great, great. Uh, I love the questions. Um, so, you know, I think I'm going to go into some, uh, you know, fun slides here, kind of, um, you know, how it started, how it's going, right? You kind of see that on social media. So, you know, there's some really notable SBR awardees. Um, you know, this is essentially, um, you know, it's like, a, you know, SBRs are considered seed funding. And you can really think about kind of like the evolution from, you know, the, how, how seed transitions into, you know, a, a plant and then blossom flower. This is, this is what those companies are, you know, here on the slide. They're flowers. Um, so you think of like Qualcomm, iRobot, um, you know, Genzyme, the makers of the Sonicare toothbrush, they all received SBR funding. And, um, you know, they're obviously really big companies today. And then there's companies like 23andMe, um, you know, Lift Labs that makes, um, you know, spoon uh, for, um, you know, folks with certain neurological disorders. Cybersecurity company Semantic also received, um, you know, SBIR funding uh, from one of my favorite agencies, the NSF, which is great. Um, and then I think lesser known, um, I actually pulled this up recently. So companies like Illumina, um, and Intuitive Surgical, the, the magical robot makers, all received, um, you know, uh, SBIR or STTR funding, um, and, and kind of, uh, you know, look at look look how how far they've come, right? I mean, certainly the other dollars help with that, you know, multiple products help with the pipeline, but I think this is, you know, a good example. These are good examples of what could happen, um, you know, potentially with companies that receive SBARs and, and these folks, uh, these companies are, are living proof. So um, I took this slide from our friends at uh, the Illinois Fast Center, um, kind of just to show <laughs> where Illinois, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this slide for me. Um, but um, I, I was putting one together I'm like yeah their slide looks awesome I'm just going to use there so um uh, so here you know kind of show kind of where Illinois um you know stacks up in, in terms of uh, funding that has come in just you know I think it you know from in 2021 over 70 million dollars in, in SBIR funding uh you know has, has come in you know well over um you know 100 uh companies um you know have gotten uh, you know these types of awards um you know both SBIR STTR which is great 
all over Illinois, you know, all over, you know, multiple agencies, um, you know, DOD, DOE, um, you know, Health and Human Services, think of, you know, that's NIH, but, you know, um, I'd love to see this number go up and, you know, hopefully talks, you know, like this and other fabulous things, uh, you know, the, the, the sponsors of this group are doing can, can lead to, you know, even more awards. So we can stop hearing things like, you know, when will Chicago be like the coast? Um, you know, to that I say, well, you know, you know, look at our numbers, they're only getting better. Um, soon it's going to be the reverse. Why can't the coast be like Chicago? And, and I think that's uh, where I'd love Chicago to be. So hopefully um, you can, you can see your company, you know, kind of framed up here, um, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, getting an SBR and STTR, um, you know, I will say, and you'll, you'll, you you kind of appreciate this as I go through the slides, it's, it's definitely not easy. It's not easy getting money in your company, period, right? Um, for those of you who have done the angel VC route, that, that's hard, right? Um, I think uh, non-dilutive funding is also hard, uh, as well. Um, but, you know, I like to tell, uh, you know, friends in the community, like, you, you can't win the lotto unless you play, right? Um, so, you, you know, you might as well try. And I always say that um, no grant effort is ever wasted. So even if you don't get awarded, and, you know, uh, speaking for, for someone, uh, you know, who, who's, who's had, um, you know, not only successes, but a number of failures in SBARs, um, you know, you, you don't quit your entrepreneur to keep going, you, you, you know, you persevere and that's how you should approach these grants. So I've talked with some entrepreneurs who say, oh, I got a terrible score on my SBIR from NIH. I don't want to do this anymore. Well, you know what? Someone else is going to take that money. So I would just take, you know, your reviews and, you know, you know, talk to others and just, you know, try for, uh, you know, a second time around. But hopefully, um, you know, we can see you here and then we can see you in this slide where we can have, you know, numbers of, of awards, um, you know, maybe in the in the in the four digit range. So I think that would be fantastic. So kind of uh, in terms of, um, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, there's there's good news and bad news with SBRs and STTRs. Um, you know, the good news is that, this really provides a lot of fuel um, for you to take, you know, uh, maybe your, your your proof of concept technology, uh, you know, that you have adding more R and D dollars to hit the next, you know, milestone. Maybe you use it in a in an animal model or go straight and see, you know, a small uh, clinical feasibility that you know type of studies. You know, that's great. That'll get you to, you know, the next milestone. And that's really how you should be thinking about commercialization. Is like instead of just kind of like this kind of like leap there's like little jumps along the way and those little those places where you land those are milestones um so in terms of other good news um what's great this is not a loan um you don't have to repay um you know the government if awarded uh unless you, you misuse the funds but that's a whole other topic but it's it's this is something that um you know uh that doesn't require repayment uh as mentioned before no equity so you don't have to give up a piece of the pie um, you know, for this. And really, I think getting the, um, you know, government grants uh, kind of approved makes you like uh, a shinier star. So, um, you know, if you, I always encourage early stage companies to do this in, uh, in parallel to diluted financing, if you're doing like a seed round, for instance, because if you get this grant and you say, hey, you know what, I'm DOD funded, I'm NIH funded, and then, you know, they'll be like, oh, okay, you know, this, that was reviewed by, you know, peers, your peers and, and, and you know, like kind of, um, you know, donate domain experts. So maybe, you know, uh, what your technology is, is, uh, is, is worth a second or third look, that sort of thing. So it really adds a lot of validation, recognition and visibility to, to what you're working on. And while great, um, I mentioned um, SBRs are, are very difficult and um, there's more and more applications uh, going in, you know, every year, which is, I think is good generally for, um, you know, kind of innovation in, in the U.S. as a whole, but maybe at the, like, individual startup level is, is bad because <laughs> there's more, more folks like you competing for the same dollars. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, um, but you, you, everyone has, you know, the same goal, and that's really to, you know, kind of, you know, benefit society with the, the technologies you, you're innovating here. 
I think also difficult, uh, you know, with these grants is that it can take a really long time to get funding. Um, some, some companies that I've met with think that, you know, they submit it and maybe in a month we'll get like, a, you know, a, this large deposit into their accounts. But, you know, this takes a while. It's a process. So the peer review process takes a while. So the panel needs to be formed. Dates need to be set for review. There's a lot of administrative work in the background. So it can take anywhere between six to seven months, maybe more, depending on the complexity of your grant. Um, so I say maybe more because let's say, for instance, you're getting funding for a multi-center trial. There's some agencies that say, hey, you know what, you need to get IRB approval. Or if you're doing it like a large animal study, you got to get that IACUC approval. So, you know, things can take a while to, to get that, that funding in hand. Um, I think what's also difficult for a lot of companies is that, you know, I meet a lot of founders where there's maybe just one or two, uh, you know, folks on the team. But the way that these grants are reviewed is that they kind of look, the reviewers look at the whole thing. So not only is that, you know, the research plan and, um, and kind of like the commercial goals you set, they look at the team behind it, right? And kind of think about how um, investors uh, evaluate companies, you know, you know, they, they typically, uh, you know, bet on the jockey, right? The person or the team kind of leading it, they want to have confidence that you guys will be able to execute. Um, you know, the reviewers, you know, feel the same way. Um, also, you know, with these grants at the phase two level, a commercialization plan is needed, which is for some people something, um, you know, it's, it's essentially a business plan uh, with very specific sections that you have to fill out. Um, this is kind of like, uh, you know, new territory for a lot of researchers because they've never had to put together a competitive analysis or, you know, financial projections, you know, that, that sort of thing. It's kind of new. So that can be you know, difficult for some companies. Um, and then finally, and I think this is a very important point. Um, that when you take government money, um, you know, you are subject, you know, to scrutiny in terms of, you know, uh, you know, the government and the auditors maybe, you know, reviewing things like your timesheets, right, time and effort reporting that, that sort of thing. Um, and that's really, that's a just, you know, kind of like a, a check for the government, you know, just to make sure that, you know, dollars are being uh, spent appropriately. But, you know, a lot of these grants where, if, you know, the, especially the larger dollar grants, um, every year you have to get an audit. So, you know, the book's got to be clean. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't just, you know, spend money in a, essentially however you'd like. But there are groups that are out there that can help uh, with the on the accounting side to make sure that your books are clean. So in terms of kind of the eligibility criteria for SBRs and SCTRs, I mentioned earlier that um, this funding is for for-profit entities. Uh, they must be independently owned and operated. The principal place of business needs to be in the US. You're using taxpayer dollars uh, you know, for, for, um, for the research. So the work has to be here in the US. I often get asked, well, I have developers overseas is that okay? You know, that, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, what I've you know, learned from the different agencies is that, you know, that work needs to be, you know, done in the U.S. As a company, you can certainly, you know, contract, you know, work outside of the U.S., but it is preferable uh, for that work to be done uh, in the U.S. You may be able to get um, permission to do some work outside the U.S. that can't be done um, in the U.S. or purchase equipment that can't be purchased here for one reason or, or another out of the U.S. But you need to contact, um, you know, the agency, your program director or your program officer for that uh, approval. Um, also, in terms of other eligibility criteria, and you know, these slides will be shared, so I won't go over them like one by one. You know. Uh, 500 employees or less. Um, I don't. I haven't met a company, uh, an SBR company, uh, uh, with uh, 500 employees, but you know that that can happen. Um, and then you know, finally, um, in terms of you know the principal investigator, uh, depending on the agency for SBRs, um, you know, have, need to be primarily employed um, at the, at the business at the time of award. And keep that in mind, that's at the time of award. So at the time of application, you may be working somewhere else, but at the time of award, when you get that award and you're the PI, you have to be primarily employed by the company. So greater than 20 hours in a 40 hour work week. Um, so you know, keep that in mind. So, you know, you, you might be wondering, you know, are, um, is the technology that I have fit? So I have this rock star team, but is there tech? you know, kind of, is, is, it, is, it, is it also, you know, fantastic? Well, what the, um, the reviewers are looking for are, you know, essentially revolutionary, not evolutionary technology. So not an incremental improvement on existing technology. They're looking for something that'll blow their mind, 
essentially, right? Impress them. So, you know, the majority of these reviewers have, you know, technical backgrounds. So, you know, uh, you know, keep that in mind as you, you know, write your research plan. You want, you want to show that you'll be able, that your technology will be a paradigm shift in, in the field. Um, and then in terms of the team, um, you know, I think the star of the show is the PI of the grant. So this is, you know, the main person who, um, you know, manages, you know, day-to-day -day operations of the grant. So this person has to have the right technical background and through their biosketch, which essentially is a CV, needs to demonstrate that they have successfully um, led projects. Um, you know, I think it helps if you have, you know, grant wins under your belt, but I have, you know, seen PIs uh, on awarded grants who've demonstrated other forms uh, of success and leadership through things like, you know, leading projects in industry, um, you know, getting, um, you know, other, uh, you know, uh, projects uh, launched and executed in, in wherever they worked. In addition to the technical team, especially when you get to the phase two level, um, the reviewers want to make sure that you have um, the right commercial folks involved um, in the grant too. So you don't necessarily need a CFO, right? You just need to have some folks on the team at the phase two level that'll help you um, with the strategy and the execution for launch. So they want to make sure that you have, you know, someone that'll help you on the operating side, someone that'll help you bring money into the company because, um, you know, spoiler alert, um, the government doesn't want to be the only source of funding to your company when they fund you in this, you know, the SBRs. It is, they have in mind that these dollars will help attract more dilutive type capital because they know that the funds that they provide you are likely not enough for you to commercialize. So they want they want to see you, that you have the you know the business team, um, you know by by way of maybe part time employees or even you know consultants to help you again strategize and execute, and then. You know, I think uh, I think I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, you got to have that kind of paradigm shift technology um, because um, you know the reviewers want to see something that's that's um, you know revolutionary in this space. And essentially, once you commercialize it, this will you know then benefit uh, you know the, the rest of the U.S. by providing jobs, that sort of thing. So you know, just kind of a, a snapshot of the different phases of um, the SBR program. It's a multi-phase approach, kind of like commercialization, right? Kind of you know those. Uh, you know, kind of the little jump that I was talking about, you land on a milestones. This is, it's kind of like that with the, with the grants where there's different phases. So phase one is, you know, the discovery feasibility, you know, does this work? Does my, you know, my kind of Frankenstein uh, technology that I've made in my garage or in the lab, um, if I put more R&D dollars, uh, you know, can it work outside those settings? That, that's what that could be used for. Um, when you move, and as you progress, you know, you do kind of larger scale um, R&D, uh, you know, maybe working with an outside partner, um, you know, kind of just to do that full R&D research. And then again, phase three is a commercial stage. So it's a process, um, you know, on average three to four year program, but, um, you know, you're using, um, you know, government grant dollars, non dilutive to, to, to fund those efforts. So um, I mentioned earlier, the work should be performed um, in the US. Um, so, you know, foreign consultants, uh, collaborators are allowable, but, you know, that the consulting work needs to be in the US um, and then um, purchase of foreign goods or services. Um, I, I would stay clear from that. It's a process if you want to get that done. Uh, I know one company that tried to get it done and it was, you know, quite a, quite a bit of work to, to do that. So here's a snapshot of the agencies that participate in, you know, this non dilutive funding program. You have, um, you know, kind of the largest player, the DOD, and then you have folks like the NIH, um, NSF, DOE, NASA, others, that sort of thing. And there's some agencies, um, and as you, you know, you do research, just keep in mind, some are SBIR only, um, and some do both SBIR and SCTR. So here's kind of a, the breakdown of the, the budgets, uh, you know, by, by agency. Uh, you know, the DOD, uh, HHS, which includes the NIH, um, FDA, and CDC, um, you know, they kind of have, the, you know, the biggest pieces of the pie. Um, you know, just a pro tip, just because they have the biggest pieces of the pie doesn't mean that you should ignore some of the other players. Like, for instance, do not ignore the NSF. For instance, do not ignore NASA because their budgets are smaller. They may have, um, you know, topic areas that might be a fit to, you know, some of your technologies. You never know. Um, for instance, so I, you know, kind of keep an eye uh, on, on those. 
So um, kind of, I'm going to go into the different agencies, um, you know, briefly one by one to kind of give you, you know, high level overview um, of, you know, kind of the, the, the SBR programs, um, you know, within their institute. So DOD has SBR and STTR contracts. Um, so I have the dollar amounts as, you know, SBR, STTR about, you know, $150,000. Um, in some cases I've seen more, it really depends on the, tech, the specific uh, topic. Um, phase two up to a million dollars, you know, phase three, you know, more dollars can be pro provided because that, you know, the DOD would be the customer there. Um, in terms of the NIH, um, you know, which, uh, um, you know, are most of the, NIH and NSF are kind of like my, um, you know, uh, my, my sweet spot in terms of, uh, you know, government agencies to get SBR funding. What's great about the NIH and NSF, actually their dollars have been going up um, in terms of, you know, budgets. Uh, I think, you know, when I first started, um, it was under 200,000 uh, uh, as, as kind of like a budget cap. But so, you know, these budgets, you know, can be over $250,000. I've seen some phase one grants and, you know, I consider them kind of outliers at, you know, uh, 400, 500,000. I've seen some that are, you know, even more, and it really depends on the institute within the NIH. So think of the NIH as a, a huge umbrella organization, and there's a bunch of institutes like the National Cancer Institute, et cetera, under that umbrella. So each of those institutes has, you know, their own, their own budget, but generally this, you know, if you're kind of keep a number in mind to say, you know, phase one is around $250,000 or 216 round up, right? Um, and then phase two for that full R&D plan, you know, just over uh, $1.7 million, which is great. Um, NIH also has, you know, phase two B funding, uh, depending on the institute. I've seen it go anywhere between two to $3 million to extend your work in phase two, which is, which is good. Um, so NIH allows for SBIR uh, and STTR, I mentioned that STTR, you're required to subcontract. And really it's um, kind of just, um, you know, uh, allocating 30% of that overall budget um, to, to, the, um, to the research institute. It can't be greater than 60%. Um, there may be some instances where that's allowed, but it's generally, um, you know, uh, not allowed, um, you know, at, at that phase. Um, An SBIR, um, you know, uh, no greater than uh, a third of the budget should be, um, you know, subcontracted out to um, to outside um, sources. So, uh, you know, this includes CROs um, and any entities outside of the company. This is that includes consultants. So, think of, you know, the outside. Uh, think of it as a bucket, right? So, you have your university, maybe consultants, any others outside the company that's in the subcontracting outside budget uh, for, for, for budget allocations. Um, but if you need to go over these kind of caps of a third and 50%, I would talk to the program officer. I have seen some companies go over at the phase two level, particularly when they're doing like a multi-center clinical trial. And that's the star of the show, you know, uh, paying a lot of, um, you know, hospitals to execute the work. So I've seen that go over 50%, uh, but that needs to be discussed, um, you know, with the, with the program officer. Um, in terms of the PI and SBIR, um, you know, that person needs to be primarily employed to greater than 20 hours in a 40 hour work week as recorded on timesheets that you need to keep. Uh, you can do electronic, paper-based, work with your accountant on that. Um, the, uh, the PI and the STCR side can remain employed um, at the company um, at the time of award, um, but needs to put at least 10% effort. So I kind of mentioned that, you know, the NIH is kind of like this umbrella institute. So here's all the different institutes uh, that fall, you know, within, uh, that fall under that umbrella rather. And each of these institutes has their own missions and priorities, but more importantly, uh, their own budget. There are some institutes here that have way higher budgets than others. Um, and they also have, um, you know, uh, you know, different pay lines. So you're, when you're granted you to receive a score, um, the lower the score, the better. Uh, perfect score is 10. So, you know, there's some agencies that say that their pay line is 25. There's some agencies that say for SBR, they'll, they'll pay up into, into the 30. So it really depends. Uh, the, the pay lines vary um, across uh, across the board uh, among the institutes. And if you want to know about those pay lines, it's kind of hard to get sometimes. You can look at historical data. Um, you know, the way that I do it is that, you know, I contact the program officer. They'll probably say, we don't have a pay line yet but the fundable range is, you know, between this number and this number. So 
I would ask what the fundable range is as opposed to like the pay line because you might get a better answer. You might. Um, as, as far as the kind of other offerings that the NIH has, um, you know, they realize that there's points along the phase one, phase two, phase three process where you know you might need some help. Um, so there's, you know, some, you know, kind of, you know, you know, market assessment, commercialization assistance programs, you know, along the way, um, you know, for NIH that you might, uh, you know, might want to take advantage of. Um, I want to talk just for a second about um, fast track awards. Um, so for, for those of you um, who might not know what fast tracks are, this is essentially when you submit a phase one and phase two application all in one monstrous application. It's a beast. For those of you who've put together Fast Track, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but so traditionally, it's, um, I have it up top, phase one, you get your money, you stop, you put together an application, you hope for the best, submit, submit that, and then you know, hopefully get the funding. Um, so that's the traditional path. The Fast Track uh, is, is where you submit phase one and phase two, for simultaneous reviews. So I think in some of my early slides, I, I showed that my company had a $4 million grant. That was a fast track uh, grant where we put together you know, phase one and phase two at the same time. So there's no stop sign. I mean, there is in terms of putting together your, um, your progress report, um, that's another government check, right? So, it's, so the money is, but isn't going to continuously flow. So it's not super easy. You have to do, complete the phase one research submit your progress report, you got to get the thumbs up from the program officers and then it'll okay the release of funds um, for phase two. So that's why I have up here kind of like the satisfactory, uh, you know, final, final report here. Um, just a few things on things you might not know about um, NIH SBIRs is that you can actually switch between uh, programs, between SBIR and SDTR. Let's say that you're a super early company um, and uh, you know you're a researcher, and you you wanted to do an STTR because the facilities, equipment, etc., you know is at the university, um, and uh, you want to leverage those resources, and you start off as an STTR, and then you got a grant, awesome. But then you said, you know what, I don't need the university as much for phase two because I was able to get some money in, get my own lab. Um, you know, hire, hire more people, maybe work with, um, you know, CRO, you can switch to an SBIR. Um, you can also do the reverse. Um, if you are, you know, a grad student, you know, uh, you know, MBA student working with some researchers, had this awesome idea, you got an SBIR, good for you. But then you say, you know what, I need to switch over to an STTR because, you know, there's, um, there's some really good resources um, that, uh, uh, you know, over there. And I think the PI, um, has a better technical background than me, and then you switch over to SDTR, so that's allowable. Um, there's also, you know, direct phase two, not every institute allows for that. And then phase two B, um, that's, you know, that is an extension of uh, your phase two um, program. That's really kind of like your bridge to commercialization. So maybe you need to do a randomized control trial, or you need to do additional R&D in um, like a different animal model, something like that, but you know, those are things um, that you can uh, potentially get. Um, I would talk with your, for those of you who have phase twos and thinking about phase two B, you know, um, uh, you know, be in contact with your program officer to make sure that um, they're comfortable with, you know, funding you and that you get the full amount that you can get. Um, so I would just keep that relationship um, open and keep them current on not only on your research, but everything else within the company, even if it's like short bullets. So this is a pro tip. So I, what I would do if you have, you know, phase one or phase two grant, you know, I would maybe monthly or quarterly, you know, send an email out to your program officer with a few bullets to be like, you know, uh, this is some of the traction that we made, you know, make it like, you know, short and sweet. So then they can, so they, they you know, they can be, um, they know what's, you know, what's going on at your company at a high level. Um, these grants are all electronically submitted. So many moons ago when the dinosaurs were on the planet, um, it was all paper-based, but now, um, you know, that transition, and thank you, thankfully so, to electronic. Um, you know, I'm not gonna go deep into um, what's all required, but just know that there are a number of registrations that are required for you to even submit. Um, you know, there have been some companies that have come to me in the past that say, you know what, I'm looking to submit grants due next week. I'm gonna just, you know, pull all-nighters and put it together. It's gonna work awesome. Did you do your registrations? And then I get that 
blank stare. Like, what are you talking about? What registrations? What are you talking about? So don't be a victim. Complete your registrations well in advance. Um, you know, it's not it's not the most fun thing to do, especially the the Sam one, that second one. Um, but you got to do them. I'm going to switch gears. Um, maybe I'm going to uh, step on the gas pedal a little bit more. Uh, the National Science Foundation, which is um, one of my favorites. Uh, it's a, a two-way tie between NIH and NSF. But you know, the NSF, um, you know, is you know they fund around 400 uh, companies a year, have an over a 200 million dollar program. Um, you know, for for SBRs, STTRs. Um, and in terms of you know dollar amounts, that also went up, which is great. Um, so phase one is up to two hundred seventy-five thousand. Uh, your research project can you know last anywhere between six to twelve months. That two-year phase two million-dollar project follows, um, you know, uh, you know that. Um, and then phase two B is five hundred thousand. I think just one one note. Uh, the difference uh, you know between NSF and NIH. So NIH has more money than NSF. So um, they have depending on the institute have more flexibility in terms of budgets but you know for nsf don't expect to get more than the amounts that i have here um you know you can get addition you can get money um above a million dollars uh for phase two but that's by way of supplements so um there are supplemental funding opportunities um once you're an s uh, phase two awardee so you might want to look into that so in terms of kind of program stats about the NSF, um, you know, the success rate, like I said, these are very difficult um, to, um, to get, um, you know, that's up to 15, 10 to 15%, it's a range, every, every year it changes. So, you know, if, if, I, if I do the talk again next year, you know, the success rate, success rate will probably change as well. Um, but, you know, every year, you know, uh, you know, a nice number of companies get acquired um, that are, um, you know, SBR, STTR funded, um, that sort of thing. But I do know um, that a lot of these uh, phase two grantees, um, you know, get that third party funding uh, by way of angel VC um, funding or, you know, just um, kind of collaborative efforts with industry, which is great. So in, I think more, a little bit more on, on the NSF here. So these are the technology topic areas that um, that they uh, provided funding for. I think this is probably the reason why I like uh, NSF SBRs so much is that their interests, the research interests are so broad. So you have, you know, they'll provide funding for advanced materials to semiconductors, to Internet of Things, just kind of, you know, really um, really, uh, you know, broad, um, you know, and I think one tip on the NSF, especially for my therapeutic friends that are out there, you know, they tell me, oh, I don't really think about NSF, I think about NIH, because that's where, you know, a lot of my academic dollars come from, um, you know, don't, you know, uh, don't count the NSF out, because they have, you know, they fund, um, you know, uh, enabling technologies um, in, in the pharma space. So, you know, delivery, uh, drug delivery type technologies, anything that enable the uh, development uh, of drugs, that sort of thing. So we're just kind of uh, going a little bit further, just, you know, if you go into, if you go on the NSF SBR website, you can click at any one of these, go further into any of these topic areas, and then you can kind of get a sense of kind of like, you know, some featured companies, some recent awardees, um, the program director, and kind of like the, the areas that they're that they're looking at for funding. Um, before you submit, um, you have to submit something called. Um, you actually need to get a green light. You need to be. A, you need to get an invitation to uh, submit a full application. And to do that, you need to submit something called a project pitch, which is um, a, you know, answering four short answer questions. They're, you know, they're, they're shown here. So you write about things that you could probably do this you know, today if you wanted to um, talk about the technology, the project you propose, the market opportunity it presents, and a little bit about your company team. So all of this is submitted electronically. Um, and then, you know, they say allow up to four weeks. I've seen some companies get it within a week. Um, I've seen some companies get it, you know, after a full month. So it really depends on the, the workload uh, of the agency at the time in which they receive your project pitch. So if that is, if that's good, then you get an invitation um, to uh, submit a full application. Um, and if not, this is actually the, um, the timeline here. You, so you learn a little bit online about SBIRs, um, you submit a project pitch, and then, um, you know, if you get a, you know, uh, an invite to apply, then you submit the full proposal. And then in about six months, maybe seven, depending on the project you're proposing. Um, and, and then, um, then you'll get, um, you'll get, you can look up your decision 
the decision uh, online. Um, I will say though, just a, just another tip um, is that uh, you know I keep an eye out for emails from the program director, um, you know, during the six month window where you're kind of on pins and needles wondering if your grant is going to get funded. Um, you know, if you get asked for information, that is typically a good sign. They would not waste their time asking for information from a company that they don't intend to fund. So, um, so you know, uh, they or they may you know, ask for some clarification. But typically, in my experience, if you do get contacted by the program director during this uh, review period, it's it's typically um, a good thing. So, kind of just um, you know, switching gears here into. You know, hopefully I've um, piqued your interest in uh, submitting and for those who are thinking of resubmitting, hopefully I've um, encouraged you to, you know, uh, throw, uh, you know, um, uh, give it another shot, um, but just, you know, know that this is a journey kind of like the whole startup thing, right? The whole path to commercialization thing is this crazy, like nonlinear journey. So um, the grants are the same way. It's, it's, it's not a sprint. You may hear some companies who get awarded their first time around or they apply for a fast track and they get it. They're outliers. That's a fact. I mean, they're fantastic. I'm happy for them. But for the vast majority of companies, um, it's it's not as straightforward. Um, you may get that rejection the first time, you may get it the second time, but then you'll get it the third time maybe. It really depends on how, how you respond um, to the reviewers, but just know that just like typical fundraising, it, it's, a, it's a marathon. So I'd like to kind of just go into um, maybe some frequently asked questions. Uh, I always get asked, you know, at least a I have so much going on in the company. I'm running these animal studies and blah, blah, blah. You know, how long is this going to take me to write the grant? I typically say generically set aside, you know, maybe two, three months uh, where you can work on this application, um, you know, with, uh, you know, with a team, um, maybe one other person in your company or maybe an external consultant, that sort of thing. Um, can companies put together, you know, grants in, in a week or two? Yeah. Sure, it depends on what you have, uh, what you can work off of. You might have some existing material that you might be able to leverage, that sort of thing, um, or, or you have some grant experience. But usually I say set aside two to three months so you can put together a, a well thought out proposal. I also get asked about kind of where the work can be done. Um, I get uh, asked like, well, can I do this in my basement? Or what about my garage? So that's, tip, that's like, you know, old school Silicon Valley, right? In the garage. Um, these government agencies want you to actually have a physical place of business that is not your garage basement or an academic lab to, to be an awardee. So at the time of award, they're looking for you to, you know, to do work in a place um, that is, uh, you know, controlled by the company. So you'll have like a lease agreement, that sort of thing. Um, I also get asked, you know, can my company work in the PIs lab at the university? Um, no, um, you can have a subcontract uh, with the university, um, but you know employees are meant to uh, under this grant are meant to you know work um, in employee uh, control facilities. You can um, you know maybe under a facilities use agreement or um, you know rented time on equipment at the university through that setup. You can you know um, you know leverage those resources if that's available um, at uh, you know the university you want to work in. Um, I think I answered the question about when the grant money comes in. It, it ranges uh, six, seven months is typical. I've seen it last longer, depending on um, how aggressive your grant is. Um, I also get asked about the qualifications of the PI. Um, uh, you know, spoiler alert, I'm not a PhD. <laughs> I'm a PI, PI of a grant. I have a couple of masters. You don't need to be a PhD to get, uh, you know, to get an SBIR. Um, but what you need, it helps though. And I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it helps because you're gonna be reviewed by typically a bunch of PhDs and MDs. Um, and uh, but what you really need to demonstrate is leadership in your bio sketch. Leadership in terms of not only um, leading a team, but leading, um, you know, prior research. That's what they want to see. They want to see, you know, good experience um, in, uh, in in what you're doing there. Um, I also get asked, you know, do I need preliminary data for a grant application? Um, it's not required, but it helps. It really does. You're up against, you're going to be up against so many other companies that have this data, whether it's simulated data or actual data in, you know, a handful of animals or even a small, um, you know, uh, a small, uh, you know, clinical study. 
Um, so, you know, just kind of, you know, be aware of that. Again, not required, but it helps. It makes you definitely more competitive. Um, I'm gonna, you know, zip through the rest of these because I wanna make sure that we have enough time for questions. Here's some application tips. Um, those registrations, I talked about electronic ones, you know, start them early, talk to your program officer before, during, and after your application, put together a strong technical team, business team to supplement, especially during the phase two um, phase. I'm going to zip through the rest of these here. I think I have them in, in separate slides. Um, oh, here's the A-team slide. So, you know, you want to make sure that you choose your PI wisely. That's 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 the star of the show. You want to make sure that um, this person's, uh, you know, bias CV, um, you know, will, um, you know, be attractive to reviewers. Um, I also get asked about IP. You know, a lot of the companies that apply for SBIRs, um, you know, either have a provisional patent or nothing filed at all. Um, the best case scenario, which is also the least likely scenario, is issued IP owned and controlled by the company. That is like the ideal situation. That 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 like there's like fewer holes to poke in that situation um, from a re reviewer's perspective. And you know, IP is is often a target in the review. Um, if you are really early and have a provisional patent filed, talk about your strategy. We have filed this provisional patent. Um, you know, broadly, you know, it covers X, Y, and Z. This protects against competitors. You know, you know that sort of thing. So. Also talk about any law firm that you might be working with who has a particular domain experience can help you with claim writing. They want to make sure that you have, you know, the right strategy uh, in terms of, um, you know, kind of like your, your IP protection. Um, you should also focus on achievable goals, um, you know, in terms of your research. Um, don't plan an RCT, a randomized controlled trial, and your phase one SBIR grant for 299000 That's likely uh, way under budget. Um, I think, you know, as you prepare your application, um, I talked about kind of like these stepping stones along the way to commercialization. Um, consider your SBIR project um, as, as, you know, a way to get you to a meaningful milestone that will attract outside dollars or just move you further along in the commercialization timeline. Um, the other tip that, you know, I wanna provide is, um, it's okay to get multiple SBIRs, you know, my company does, but I have that second point, do not be a bad grant machine. There are some companies that exist out there that just get SBIRs in and don't really commercialize. They just get money in. Um, that's not really, you know, that's kind of frowned upon. I would stay away from that because really this program is meant to further, um, to commercialize technologies to benefit uh, American society. Um, also, um, you know, ask a colleague to read an application. I know one company that submitted a grant with the wrong figure and it tanked the application because the reviewers are so confused by it. So have someone else review, someone else that you trust to review your application just to make sure that you don't make a mistake like that. Um, here's a, you know, kind of a short list. Again, I'll share my slides of reasons why, um, you know, grants aren't funded. Typically in my experience, it's a poor experimental approach. Um, that you didn't really articulate the specific aims and the research steps to achieve those aims. They want to see that detail. Um, and, you know, maybe I think it's a good time to stop since there's like, uh, you know, a couple of minutes left. Here's some, some sources um, that you can certainly follow. But maybe I'll just stop right there in the last few minutes that we have here um, and answer questions um, that you all may have. Annalisa, thank you so much. Um, and I, I... I'm sure that probably Laura Frerix um, Appenzeller would like to say a few words as well, but um, I did want to re reiterate a couple of things. First of all, thank you so much to the FAST Center of Illinois and to the University of Illinois Research Park. I know without them having this grant, we, we would be unable to, um, you know, to put on this seminar series and really happy for UIC to be partnering with them as well as, um, uh, Portal Innovations, and as well as World Business Chicago. So thank you so much to, um, to everyone there. And I do want to reiterate one very important point that you made at the very beginning, and that is to keep attending these seminars, right? If you've been sitting through this for the last hour, there is a lot of information and um, a lot of good questions that can be answered with the um, document that Laura Appenzeller shared a little earlier in the chat as well, which um, maybe she'll post again to everybody. But the YouTube website, there's a wealth of information. And don't forget that you can um, request 
one-on-one -on -one appointments, ask questions anytime through the Illinois FAST Center too. So there are a couple of questions maybe I think that were not addressed that we could go back to. Um, we had a question from Alex Prokop. He was asking about the um, USDA and does every um, agency allow you to go directly to a phase two or is that just, you know, is it usually just NSF or um, NIH that allows that? You know, I'm less familiar with the USDA, but I think to answer your question more broadly, not every agency allows you to go directly to phase two. So, you know, for instance, the NSF doesn't allow you to jump uh, to phase two. So you might want to check if the USDA does or not. Maybe someone here might know the answer to it, but um, not every agency allows you to do that. Yeah, I think we just haven't had as much experience with USDA. We've had, you know, we have had a number of startups um, that have gotten um, awards from them, but not as many as, as NIH or NSF. So that's a good mm -hmm. question. Only thing um, I would maybe say on that one is be careful because I think USDA only does one solic solicitation and award per year, and it's harder to go to to get, I think, Annalisa, you would say the chances you mentioned this of getting a fast track award are much slimmer than getting a phase one. So you may miss an entire cycle if you're just trying to expedite. Just a yeah. thought. Yeah, very good point. Um, let's see. Laura, is there another question up here that we haven't yet addressed? I know we're running out of time. It's 11 o'clock and we, many of us probably have other meetings to go to. Um, but our next topic we'll cover will be a deep dive into NSF, um, specifically budgets. So I know there were, there were a couple of budget questions. So please do make sure that you're registered um, for next week's seminar. It's the same Zoom um, address that you used today. Um, so you can put it on your calendar and it's at 10 a.m. again on June 9th. And of course, we'll have Annalisa again with us and hopefully as many interested parties as we had today. That was great participation. We had over 50 people, which was terrific. And again, just want to thank the Illinois Fast Center as well as um, Portal Innovations and uh, World Business Chicago and of course, Annalisa herself. One other question, maybe you addressed on it, addressed it briefly, Annalisa, and thank you, Cynthia, for mm -hmm. hosting and for UIC's participation and overall support of these efforts. Um, faculty, since some of them are on this, there was a question about can a faculty be a PI, and I, I tried to address that, but Annalisa, this is sometimes a good time to include somebody else that might be a postdoc or other scientists you know or other business collaborator in these discussions as well, since they likely will need to be involved. Yeah, yeah, for an SBIR, you know, the, um, the faculty cannot be, uh, you know, a PI, uh, you know, on the grants, uh, you know, especially, um, you know, on the NIH side, that must be, an, a, a, you know, a primarily employed uh, at the business uh, employee, um, you know, they can certainly participate um, as a, a co-PI, I've been on uh, funded grants where on an SBIR where, you know, there was a, you know, kind of a co-PI where there's, you know, full-time employee, a, you know, faculty PI, you know, that sort of thing. You also have to make sure you check the effort, you know, with your university if you want to serve uh, as a, you know, co-PI, because um, you have to make sure that you don't exceed uh, allowable effort, um, you know, but for, for um, just another, uh, you know, pro tip on the NSF, the PI, whether it's SBI or STTR, must be primarily employed at the company at the time of award. So that is not a faculty member. You can be a co-PI on an STTR, though. Great. Hope to see you guys at the you know the remaining sessions, and even the in-person one at Portal, where you can you know ask me some questions you know live. So um, thanks so much for the opportunity.